Our scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Revelation, chapter 14, verses 6 through 13. Revelation 14, 6 through 13. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him. For the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea, and the springs of water. And another angel followed, saying, Babylon has fallen, is fallen. That great city, because she has made all nations drink the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, He himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night who worship the beast and his image, and whoever receives the mark of his name." Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Then I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Write, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works follow them. Brother Brian will now have our message. Good morning, church. Happy Sabbath. I have the opportunity, the privilege, the blessing, and the burden of preaching the third angel's message. Now, I kind of want to compare it to um, fourth quarter of, of a football game. We're behind by six points. There's only 30 seconds left on the clock. The coach puts in the play of the day. All right? And fortunately for me, Jeff was the quarterback. Dave was the lineman. All I have to do is celebrate in the end zone, folks, okay? So thank you, gentlemen, for the hard work that you placed uh, in those messages before. I have the opportunity this morning to talk to you about the third angel's message. And what a wonderful blessing that's going to be for all of us. However, as I prepared for this message... I realized that the scope of the three angels' messages is so broad and so deep that we could preach 52 sermons on it and still not be able to cover it in its entirety. For wrapped into the three angels' messages are all 66 books of the Bible. And everything that's happened in thousands and millions of years before today and thousands and millions of years yet to come. All focused in these three angels' messages. Now, in the book of Revelation 14, uh, there aren't just three angels. There's three more angels after these three. But those three angels are just carrying out God's will. These three angels that we are focused on have something to say to each of us here this morning. Now, some of you maybe have been... Uh, raised in the Adventist church for many years. And the idea and the the, the concept of three angels' messages is something you've heard, grown up with, been around, read about, thought about, and um, even shared with other people. It is so uh, tied into our church, its mission and its message, that you'll see the three angels represented in our church's logos, and, and we find it on all of our publications and various media outlets. In fact, I believe we even have it carved here on our pulpit, here in our church. That's how fundamental, how crucial these three angels in Revelation 14 are for each of us this morning. I would like to turn your attention, however, to um, another message that Paul gave 
in Acts 26. The picture is, Paul is in chains. He's appealed to go to Rome. And while he's waiting for the boat that's going to take him there, he is a, a prisoner, a house guest, as it were, of some of the noble folks, and uh, primarily Festus. Now, Festus had a good buddy. Uh, it's good, you know, if you're a king to get along with the people around you, right? His good buddy was King Agrippa. Now, King Agrippa was very familiar with Judaism. Okay? He knew all of the things that went on in all the feasts, all the, all the, the commands, all the legalisms, all the stuff that was going on in Israel. Agrippa knew all of that. And he had heard, I'm sure, about Jesus Christ. However, he was getting his words and his messages and his understandings from false media. All right? All right? So, so he wasn't hearing the straight truth about who Jesus was. And he knew that there was a little bit of discrepancies in the things that he was hearing, that people weren't always telling it exactly the same way. And so here was Paul, and so Agrippa saw his opportunity. He says, you know what, I'm going to hear it from the, from the mouth of the person who's uh, stirring all this trouble up right now. I want to hear what Paul has to say. I want to get the other side of the story here. And so he set up a time, an appointment, for Paul to talk to them. So here's Festus and Agrippa, and Paul begins to share. And how does Paul start? He starts with his own story. Brothers and sisters, if you ever find yourself before the authorities, one thing that most people don't realize is they can discredit anything you say, but they can't discredit your testimony. I'll say that again. They can discredit anything you say, but they cannot discredit your testimony. So when you say, I believe, they might disagree with what you say you believe, but they cannot discredit the fact that you believe it. Brothers and sisters, that's important for us. We need to know what the truth is and believe it. Make it part of ourselves because we will be discredited from time to time by others. But never should our testimony be discredited. Okay, we stand firm. And Paul did the same. He mentioned to Agrippa and Festus how on the road to Damascus, as he was intent, like many others, to destroy this Christian movement, that Jesus stopped him himself. And so he began to talk about how uh, Christianity, what it was about, what Jesus came to do, the whole the whole thing. In fact, I'll just say, put it this way. Paul preached the three angels' messages to Agrippa that day. The sad commentary is we find here uh, in verses 24. And as Paul thus spoke for himself, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, you're beside yourself. All your learning has made you crazy. And Paul replied, I'm not crazy, most noble Festus, but I speak forth the words of truth and soberness. And then he points to Agrippa. And he says, For the king knoweth of these things, before whom also I speak freely. For I am persuaded that none of these things are hidden from him. Do you see the picture? Agrippa has been, had revealed to him all of the truth that he needs to make a decision for Jesus Christ. For I am persuaded that none of these things are hidden from him, for this was not done in a corner somewhere. And then he turns his gaze on King Agrippa, and he says, King Agrippa, believest thou the prophets? And then it was almost like a rhetorical question. Because then Paul answers it. He says, I know you know. I know you believe the prophets. 
And then he paused. Can you see in your mind's eye the struggle that must have been going on in King Agrippa's heart as two powerful forces were fighting for control? The Holy Spirit and Satan. Agrippa found himself caught in the balances and he had to make a decision now. Sadly, the scripture reveals that as Agrippa wrestled with this, he looked at Paul, and in verse 28, here's his response. Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. And Paul replied, I would to God that not only you, but also that all that hear me this day were both almost and altogether such as I am, except for these bonds. Oh, it must have broken Paul's heart to hear Agrippa come this close to the kingdom and turn away. Brothers and sisters, we are all today in Agrippa's shoes. Many of us have heard the message over and over again, time and time again, in many different ways from many different voices. And yet today, we too, like Agrippa, must make a decision. Where do we stand? Before we get into this message, I'd like us to pause for a prayer. Gracious Father, as we sit here in these pews of comfort, or are at home watching or listening, Lord, help us to realize the seriousness of our present condition. May we also hear the Holy Spirit appealing to us as Paul appealed to Agrippa. And Lord, I pray that unlike Agrippa, we might not say, almost were persuaded, but rather, Lord, we might fall on our knees and say, Lord, here am I. Send me. Show me. You've called. May in this message today we each hear clearly that clarion call that you have sounded for each of us. In Christ's name, I ask these things. Amen. All right, we read as our scripture text the entirety of the three angels' messages. There's quite a few verses there. But I want to give it a little bit of context. So when Jeff covered that first angel's message, and we talked about it a little bit at Sabbath school this morning, so those of you who weren't here, you missed out a little bit on that conversation. I'd encourage you to be here for that if you can. Um, there's so much wonderful things that come out as we study God's word together. And I thought Brother Rick did an awesome job of moderating and bringing us together where we could share uh, what we've learned and experienced from God's word. But that first angel's message is basically a declaration of God's truth and his eternal covenant. Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come. And worship him who made heavens and earth, the sea, and the fountains of water. Right? The everlasting gospel, it says, that angel had. Saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, right? Having the everlasting gospel. Meaning that that gospel that that angel was carrying is the same one that Paul gave to Agrippa, the same one that Jesus preached to the multitudes, the same one that was preached to you and me, the same message, the same gospel, the everlasting gospel. It never changes. It never will. And the idea of the gospel is good news. It is there for encouragement. It's to be something that we want to look forward to. So, are you excited about the gospel? What does it tell you? What does the gospel tell you in its nutshell? Doesn't it tell you that although God is someone who we should respect, although God is almighty and powerful, though he created everything, he did it all, with one goal in mind, one purpose, for you and me. He didn't do it for himself. 
He didn't need to do it for himself. He did it for us. That's the great truth. And God says, when you hear this truth, it should stir within you a love for God to want to worship him. Not because he's some powerful being, but because he loves us so much that it causes us in return to wish to love him above all. And that whatever he wants is something we want to do. Right? I notice sometimes, and I remember as a child, there were times when um, I didn't love my mother so much. I'm sorry to say that, ladies. I didn't love my mother so much. It was usually when she was telling me to make my bed, or brush my teeth, or comb my hair, or change my shirt, because that shirt doesn't go with those pants. Okay? I didn't much care for my mom at those times. But when Mother's Day came around, when her birthday came around, all of a sudden, I did want to celebrate all the nice things about mom. And I will tell you, my mother passed away 30-some years ago, and I miss her dearly. I miss her dearly. I think sometimes I wish I could have told her then what I would want to tell her now. And that's regret, right? And we all have them. Oh, I hope we don't have any regrets when we see Jesus to say, you know what? I wasn't too happy when you told me to do this and do that and do the other thing. And all he's going to do is look at us and say, if you love me, keep my commandments, right? It's all about love. It's not about what we're doing. It's all about love. That first angel's message spells out clearly two things. One, the truth about God. And two, the need for you and me to embrace it. For the hour of his judgment has come. The time is here, folks. It's not some way off in the future, ten generations from now. Okay? It's now. The hour of his judgment has come. Now, the thing of it is, if, if all the, we had to do, if all, any of us, the people in the world around us, if the only thing we had to do was say, Lord, I believe, that'd be pretty easy. Really? You know, it would be pretty easy. But there's a complicating factor called sin. Sin was introduced into the universe by who? Satan. And it still exists. Would you agree? Anybody not believe that there's such a thing called sin? Oh, there are people that do believe that. And I think we all would think they need to have their, uh, their mental capacity checked, right? It's pretty evident that there's evil in the world and sin around us, right? The sad thing is that not only is the devil the source of that evil, but he perpetuates it. And he tries to perpetuate it by labeling it as good news. Right? So, you know, here we share God's good news. Oh, that's wonderful. And say, oh, that's nothing, man. Let me tell you about my good news. And he starts in. And once he gets started, it's hard to get him to stop. Have you ever noticed that? Once the devil starts... It's hard to get him to stop. And you know what? He's been at this game for a long time. And the second angel's message that Dave so wonderfully shared with us, in fact, uh, Dave, I felt your pain when I prepared for this message because there's way too much stuff to be able to cram it into you know, a short sermon. So I, I know he had a lot more he wanted to say, and he just didn't have the time to share it all with us. The evidence is abundant as Dave will attest, the evidence is abundant that Babylon is fallen, that the system that Satan is perpetuating as actually the better system is worse. And you know, it's interesting to me today, although it's not necessarily to the same extent, that there are many today who want to tell us that our nation and its, its laws and the way in which we were founded as a as a democracy, free people with liberty and justice for all and all those wonderful things, that there are a lot of people out there who want to tell us it's evil, awful, and terrible, 
and needs to be thrown out the window for something else. And they haven't been able to show me, at least, that the something else is better than what we've got. And the devil's in the same boat, okay? He's got to try to sell his bag of goods as being better than what God had. But you know what? He's a pretty good salesman. He's pretty effective at it. So thank you, Brother Dave, for pointing out to us and reminding us that Satan's plan is doomed to failure already. The third angel's message then asks us, what do we want to do with the information that we have? Um, a few weeks ago, when I had the uh, privilege of sharing this, the Sabbath school lesson, I shared a, an illustration of uh, a legal system and a class action lawsuit and tried to draw some parallels between what Christ did for us, the plan of salvation, and a class action lawsuit. You know, Jesus decided to step in to our fallen situation and to offer himself in our place. The Bible refers to him as the second Adam. He came to fix what Adam broke. And because Adam broke it, all of us inherited that brokenness, one way or another. It's in our culture. It's in our society. It's everywhere. We cannot escape it. We cannot break out of it. We don't have the ability to do so. And Jesus, who was God, thought it not for himself to be equal with God, the Bible says, but that he lowered himself to become a servant. Oh my, the devil must have been just salivating with glee to see that this powerful God was going to take on human flesh and live here on this earth where he had already conquered Adam and Eve and everyone since then except those who by faith were willing to trust God. Oh man, this will be a piece of cake. Boy, just let me, let me at him. Let me at him. I just can't wait, the devil says. Can you imagine? We have it tough with sin. And I don't think the devil gives any of us 100% of his attention. Okay? I don't think so. He, he, you know, whoa, yeah. Oh, Brian's kind of wiggling a little bit. Here, I'll, I'll just take care of him real quick. All right? He's not giving me 100% of his attention. No. But with Jesus Christ, he did, did he not? He loaded every gun he had. He grabbed every hand grenade he could find. He enlisted every fallen angel to gang up on and make Jesus fail. Praise the Lord this morning. I have good news for you. Jesus did not fail. And because he didn't fail, you and I have an opportunity that we never would have had without it. Jesus at the garden went to his father and said, I will stand in their place. I will stand as a representative of the class of fallen humanity. And I will overcome Satan and his arguments. I will pay the price for them falling. Can you imagine that? Look at yourself and say, why would he do that for me? Why? What is there redeemable about me? That God would be willing to bankrupt all of heaven. That God would be willing to give up his throne above to be put on a cross to die for you and me. Amazing grace, isn't it? Amazing love. How can it be that he would give his life for me? Wow. But he did it. And when he did it, his father declared it good. Now think about the ramifications of that. Satan is condemned, right? The, the courts of heaven have already decided his case and the case of all the fallen angels. They're already sentenced to death. The only thing that's holding it up 
is the execution, the day of judgment and execution, is going to be for everyone and everything that has sin on it. When God, when God lets that guillotine knife go down, he's going to sever sin from the universe 100% just like that. No questions asked. So what's holding things up? It's because God is wanting to save each one of us from that fate. And so uh, some of you may have seen ads on TV where, you know, some big product or pharmaceutical or something has been found to maybe be not as good as, as it was intended. And so people have suffered or died or gotten diseases because of they took this medication or used this product. And what happens is there's some person who stands as the representative for all the people that have suffered from this particular product, okay? They go into court and they present all their evidence. Then the judge makes a determination whether or not they are right or wrong or not. If so, he finds in favor of them, but because it's a class action, the judge puts off the carrying out of the decision to a date in the future, okay? And in between the time that he makes that declaration and when he carries it out, the person who won the case is empowered to go and find anybody and everybody who shares their same condition so that they can be included in the reward or the award or whatever's being handed out at the end. Okay? Do you see the parallels of that with what Jesus has done for us? So God has set a date in the future and only the Father knows that date. Okay? Only the Father knows the day and the hour of when it's over. But there is a day. In the meanwhile, the call goes forth Jesus used the parable of the wedding feast. He sends invitations. Hey, come, come to the party. Come be part of this. Okay, join, join in with me with the celebration of the victory that we've won. Sadly, Jesus says in his parables, many found other excuses. I, well, I just got married myself. Sorry, Jesus, I uh, don't have time right now. Oh, I just bought a new piece of land. I got to check it out. Sorry, Jesus, I'm going to pass. Okay? How many in history have passed on Christ's invitation? I read one for you right here. King Agrippa. He passed. He said, thanks, but no thanks. And many, many will do so. Many more, however, choose to opt in and be a member of this class that Jesus has placed. The redeemed of all ages. And when that date comes, when the Father says it's over, if you've opted in, you're written in the book of life. Your name gets put there. When you opt in, your name gets put in that book of life. However, if you opt out, what happens to people who opt out of these class actions? Well, basically, they're told, that's fine. You can, uh, you can ask for your own day in court. You can present your own personal evidence. And uh, you can take your chances with the judge as to whether or not um, you win or lose. And so many today are choosing to opt out. They don't like what Jesus is offering. They think they can do it better on their own. But friends, anyone who opts out must set, stand before that great white throne that we read about in Revelation and must answer for themselves to their almighty God of, regarding their sin. The Bible warns us that there is no other name given among men whereby we must be saved. So this morning, the third angel is warning you if you opt out you're choosing a very, very, very bad option.
option. Because no one other than Jesus Christ has fulfilled all the obligations that the law of God demands. Only Christ. Not even the angels can fulfill that. Only Jesus. I'm so glad he opted to represent us and be that new Adam. Be that person who was willing to sacrifice all of heaven and all that he had to forever be one of us. Do I hear an amen on that? Wow. Wow, church. I'm wondering if I'm getting through. Okay? Really, I'm, I'm concerned. So, Rev Revelation 14, when it talks about the third angel's message, there is a very definite parting of the ways between those who opt in and those who opt out. Now, people that opt out, the devil is quick to notice that. Oh, I see you opted out. Yeah. Hey, come over here. I, I can represent you. Right? The devil calls people over and he says, look, he says, you, did, you made the right decision because God's all messed up. He's all messed up. And, and Jesus, oh, he claims that he, that he did it, but no way. Uh -uh. I got a better plan. And so he sells people on the fallen Babylon stuff that Dave talked about last time. He sells all of that like it's truth, like it's the better thing. And these poor deluded people who opted out buy into it, lock, stock, and barrel. The angel of record, the angel with the inkhorn, as Revelation talks about it, has a list of every single person who has ever lived on earth. And he has two check boxes. One says opt in, one says opt out. There's no third option, folks. Okay? Opt in, opt out. And as our lives close and we're laid to rest in the wonderful cemetery where daisies will grow over our, over our corpse, okay? The ink corn, the pen, the check mark. Opt in or opt out. At some point in time, and this is where the first angel's message was so important. It comes to you and me as the living. It's a little bit harder to choose for that ink horn, to, for that pen to mark opt in or opt out because there still is grace. There still is time. There still is an opportunity for us to make that decision. And folks, let me, let me just be honest with you. Vast majority of people in the world around us aren't wanting to make that choice, so they're ducking it, right? They see the ad come up and says, you've got till, you know, August the 20th. Well, let's see, it's, it's April, I've got time, okay? Well, it's May, well, I've got time. Well, it's June, I probably should think about it, but I've got other things to do. Isn't that kind of how life goes for a lot of us, right? right? When, do you, when do you start thinking about your income taxes? Do you think about them in June for next year? Some people do. But most people probably don't, right? But boy, when it gets down to around February, March, you know, yeah, hey, I better get this, I better get this taken care of, right? And so it also is that same human nature that we have, that we use in making decisions and putting things off in our everyday life. The sad truth is we do the same thing with our spiritual life. Not now, Lord, later. I'll get around to it. But there comes a time, folks, where the trends of our life, the way in which we're living our life, the decisions that we're making, make it very clear whether we're opting in or opting out. For those who haven't made the decision, the devil isn't sitting idly by. The Bible says he goes about like a roaring lion. How many of you heard a lion roar? Okay. Uh, when you heard that lion roar, was it on television? Or was it in, in, for real, a for real lion? How many had a for real lion that you heard roar? Okay. Now, my next question is, was that lion in a zoo? 
behind bars somewhere where it couldn't get to you? Okay. How about if you're out in, in the steppes of Africa, East Africa, you know, and uh, you're on a safari and you see a lion and it roars? It kind of might change how you feel about it a little bit, right? But then you're going to say, yeah, but I'm in, I'm in this nice Jeep, you know, this, this Land Rover, right? And the guy sitting next to the driver, he's got a gun, right? So I, I should be okay. What if they said, hey, the Land Rover just broke down. You're on foot 30 miles that way. And that lion roars. Okay? Does it make a difference? Do you think it makes a difference? Friends, I'm telling you. You can't think that the lion, the roaring lion that the Bible talks about is in a zoo someplace. No. He's hungry. He's roaming about. Okay? And you don't have a gun. You don't have a Land Rover to sit in and escape. You are on foot. And unless you have the protection of God Almighty, it's not looking very good. Do you see the picture? It's so important for us to grasp this, brothers and sisters, because it's so easy for us to get kind of mentally deadened to this whole appeal. Jesus is coming, Jesus is coming, Jesus is coming. And then it's just kind of like, eh, okay, it becomes background noise. Right? We just kind of tune it out. We hum along as we're doing other things. Okay. Folks, we can't do that. The third angel's message makes it very clear that if we tune it out, if we tune out the appeal of God, if we don't make our choice to opt in, we are going to be choosing opt out. Choosing opt out is the same thing as the mark of the beast. Okay? That's kind of in my, my words, my understanding of what I've studied here. Opting out is getting the mark of the beast. Because if you're not on God's side, you're automatically on the other side. Right? Because we're rebels by nature. We're um, lawbreakers by nature. We have a record. You know, the sad thing in a lot of our inner cities is many of our young people, they get a record with the law before they even can vote. Let me say that again. They get a record of being a lawbreaker before they can even vote. And you know, sad to say, it's true for all of us in a spiritual sense. Okay? We have a record before we even decide whether we're going to opt in or opt out, right? It's almost like our life's been programmed to opt out, right? That's the default decision. But brothers and sisters, God is appealing to you this morning. You do have an option. You can opt in. You can do it. That's God's covenant. Not only can you do it, but God will help you. You know, one of the big arguments people are making about all these new voting laws and things is, well, you're cheating people out of the opportunity to get to where they need to go to be able to vote. You're putting conditions on them that they can never meet. Well, friends, when we talk in the spiritual sense, God not only will come and pick you up at your house and take you to the polling place, he'll make sure you have ID or whatever else you need to be able to cast your vote. Okay? God will see to that. He won't let the devil or anybody else steal your vote in a spiritual way. Okay? So God is doing everything possible to allow you, to encourage you to opt in. And yet, sadly, many of us, like King Agrippa, will say, almost, almost, I'm almost ready, but not quite yet. If you opt in, there also is a mark for you. Everybody gets a mark. Okay? If you opt out, you get the mark of the beast. If you opt in, you get the seal of God. And that seal, God always places it in only one place. Now the mark you can get in a lot of different ways. But the seal of God always, 
always goes one place in your forehead. And in the Bible, when it speaks about putting something in your forehead, it's talking about planting that in your mind, making that part of your character, who you are. Okay? They used to stamp and brand people if they were slaves. The Bible even talks about it in the Law of Moses. If somebody opted to become a slave, they were to be, they were to be marked, right? And they would carry that the rest of their life. The seal of God is just the same. It's a permanent mark that's placed in your forehead. And what does that really mean? What does that really mean? It means that everything you think about, every decision you make, you want to make it based on the gospel, the everlasting gospel. And so it becomes true that saying, what would Jesus do, right? We would ask ourselves, what would Jesus do in this situation? How would Jesus handle this? What, would, what decision would he make? And not asking it rhetorically, right? But really deep soul searching. What would God have me to do? You know, a lot of times in our prayers, and I've talked about this, and Dave, I really want to follow up on that intercessory prayer because prayer is something that I really, really enjoy studying and learning more about. But one thing that I have found about prayer is oftentimes we don't pray as we should. We pray as we used to doing. And a lot of times we tend to take in that, uh, that fallen attitude of, Lord, I can do it, I just need a little boost, right? You know, I, I got it, but I just, I, I just need a little bit more, you know. Uh, I think I can make it on the gas in the tank, but, you know, if you pu pump a little more in, I think I'll be fine. Where prayer really should be, Lord, what would you have me do? Right? The Lord can do everything in our life if we just let go and let God, right? And that's not just a trite saying. We should be experiencing that in our life every day. What would you have me to do, Lord? Here am I. Send me. What direction should I go? It's interesting that when God was giving out the duties and the jobs and the hats and the badges that all go with salvation. There were some that God kept for himself. And not because he didn't trust you or trust me, but because he wanted to be sure that it was done fairly and equally for everyone, and it required power that you and I don't have. Does that make sense? So he kept things for himself that you and I don't have the ability or the power to actually do. And it needs to get done. So God says, don't worry, I'll take care of that. Okay? I'll take care of that. One of the things that God reserved to himself was leading and guiding to truth. That's the Holy Spirit. You know, the Holy Spirit puts that hat on. He says, I'm your tour guide. All right? I've got the tour guide hat. I'm the guy in the bus that's going to tell you and the driver what to see out the windows, right? And I'm going to let the bus driver know when to turn, where we're going next, what's the next thing on the agenda. I'm in charge. God didn't leave that to you or to me or to Martin Luther or to Martin Luther King Jr. or anybody else, Charles Wesley. You go down the list, all these wonderful people. He didn't leave it to Paul. He didn't leave it to Peter. He reserved it for himself because it's so critically important. If God did that, and since God did that, because it's not even if, since God did that, what are the implications of that for you and me? Should we be directing our own lives in our own footsteps? Should we be deciding whether we're going to turn to the left or turn to the right or go straight ahead or stop where we are? When we're faced with temptation, do we know the way where the exit door is or are we going to rely on the Holy Spirit to help us escape? Right? Because it says for every sin, every temptation, there is a way of escape, right? The problem for most of us is we forget where it is. Right? And when the Holy Spirit says, hurry up, over here, here's the door, come on, over here, over here. We're going, huh, 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 what, 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 what? Oh, oh I think I'm going to go this way. Oh, I see a door over here. I'm going to go that door. The Holy Spirit said, don't go that door. That door's locked. It's not going to help you. 
I'm not going to let you out. Over here, over here. Huh? That's how we oftentimes get ourselves into deep weeds, right? Because we think that we can figure it out, right? Now, just because God gives us spiritual eyesight doesn't give us license for stupidity, okay? Spiritual eyesight doesn't give us license to do things we shouldn't do because it makes it doubly wrong because not only can we see the problem, but we're not willing to listen to what he has to say about how to get out of the problem. And that is why the seal of God becomes stamped in our foreheads because we learn to listen and follow what God says and not listen to what our heart says. Not listen to what the people around us say. Not listen to what Satan says. But listen only to God. Now, uh, we live in an age of phones, right? Have you ever answered the phone and not recognized the voice of the person on the other end? I have. Brother Jeff called me once and I didn't know it was him, right? Why? Why wouldn't I know it's him? Because I don't talk to him that often. At that time, I, I don't think, maybe it was the first phone call he ever made to me. Okay? I didn't know who he was. I didn't recognize his number. And my first instinct was, boop, I'm not, I'm not going to answer that call. Nope, I'm not listening to that. Right? Have you done that? You see a phone number pop up. Oh, it might be a robocall. Forget it. I don't know who it is. So I'm not answering. What if it was the guy from Publishers Clearinghouse saying you won $10,000 a week for the rest of your life? You just hung up on him, right? You say, ah, nope, sorry, not interested. I don't know who you are. Brothers and sisters, in a spiritual way, we do the same thing. If we don't know the voice of the Holy Spirit, how are we going to recognize it and know to answer it? If we don't know the number of the Holy Spirit, how will we know to answer the phone and not, and, and not just shut it off saying it's a robocall? Because the Holy Spirit will keep trying, okay? He will keep trying and trying and trying. He doesn't give up. It's that important. Think about it. Your eternal salvation. It's that important. I'm glad the Holy Spirit doesn't give up, aren't you? I'm glad he didn't say, well, that's 50 times. Forget it. I'll move on. No. He continues to plead and plead with us and talk to us. So what's the difference? If you opt in, you learn to recognize the voice of the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit's saying something to you, you have enough common sense and faith to believe that he's telling you the truth and to do it. Not because you're trying to check boxes off for yourself, off your checklist of righteousness, but because you recognize the voice of the Holy Spirit and you know every time the Holy Spirit says something to me, it's something I need to do. You know, people pay lots of money to have financial advisors tell them when to buy and sell stocks. Buy this one, sell that one. Stay away from this one. Buy more of that one. Right? We pay people like that lots of money to manage things like that. The Holy Spirit is better than any financial advisor. It's a spiritual advisor better than anybody who went to study at any, any university and got any theology degree. The Holy Spirit is the best spiritual advisor you can ever have. So when, the, when he speaks, we should listen. I remember as a kid, there was a, there was a commercial, E.F. Hutton, which was an investing firm, and it says, when E.F. Hutton speaks, everybody listens, right? Okay? It should be the same with the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit speaks, we should, whoa, okay, hey, this is something I need to know. He wouldn't tell me if it wasn't. But so often, we hear what he has to say, Okay, I'll take that under advisement. And then we just decide to invest in our own ways. The seal of God is when we are willing to listen to the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit says buy, we buy. When the Holy Spirit says sell, we sell. When the Holy Spirit says sit and wait, we sit and wait. And we don't sit, how much longer? How much longer? No. We sit and wait with patience. Can you do that? Can you do that? That's all God's asking, that you listen. You sit and wait. And whatever he asks you to do, you say, yes, Lord, 
I don't know how I'm going to do it. I don't know where I'm going to find it. But I'm going to do it because you've asked me. Because you wouldn't ask me to do something that you don't always make sure that it's going to happen in the end. Do you believe that about God? If God says, you do this, and I'm going to take care of that. And in the end, this is what it's going to be. Right? And we're faced with, do we believe God or not? Are we going to follow that path, or are we not going to follow that path? If he says, do this, and this is going to happen. Think about like with Abraham we studied in the lesson today. God comes to him, he's 99 years old. 99 years old. He says, you're going to be the father of many nations. Your descendants are going to be like the stars of the heavens and the sands of the sea in number. And Abraham must have been in the, that first thought thinking, are you serious, God? Really? And we know from scripture that Sarah was laughing in the other room. Said, That's not possible. Right? God even changed his name. We studied today in, in Sabbath school. He changed his name from Abram to Abraham, meaning father of multitudes. It's like, what was in the Kool-Aid God was drinking that day? Right? Have you ever really felt that way sometimes when you seem like God is asking you to do something? You know, What's in the Kool-Aid, God? Because it don't make sense to me. Friends, opting in says we trust God. If he says it, he will do it. The Bible says in the book of Psalms, he commanded and it stood fast. He spake and it was done. The centurion in Christ's day believed what David wrote in the Psalms because he all but repeated it when he said to the Lord, speak the word only and my servant shall be healed. Right? You don't even have to come to my house. Just say it and it's done. Right? Do you believe that about God? Have you seen that in your life? If you haven't seen it in your life, one of two things is happening. Either you're looking in the wrong direction or you haven't trusted God. Now, I'm not here to tell you which one's the right answer. Maybe it's all of the above. Okay? But if that's the experience in your life, brothers and sisters this morning, I want to encourage you to listen to God. And as you do, that seal will be placed on your forehead. You will be opting in to having the victory of Christ and his sacrifice applied to your life. And you know the wonderful thing about uh, class action lawsuits, uh, at least here in America? You can join the class and never have to travel to New Jersey or California to, uh, to appear in the courtroom. Your name's on the list, you're in. Brothers and sisters, do you realize that you and I will not have to sit through that great white throne judgment and have our name called and have to explain anything for ourselves? We'll be in the city watching it happen. We'll be like the jury, right? Just watching what's going on and making sure that everything looks, looks good. It's going to be really hard, I'm sure, for many of us to see loved ones and people we know having to stand and answer for themselves because they weren't willing to opt in. Friends, God says that there's a day coming, the hour of his judgment has come. Okay? There's going to be a time when Jesus is going to say, let him who is righteous be righteous still. Let him who is filthy be filthy still. There will be a day when Jesus will no longer stand before the altar pleading for your sins and mine. There's a day when God closes up shop and things change. The day of judgment will have arrived and there's no going back. And if you haven't opted in, you've opted out. Ellen White uh, in, in the books, um, and I recommend these books highly to you, Spiritual Gifts. Spiritual Gifts. She talks about a lot of this. And one of the things she says is just like in the days of Noah, when the, when the grace and the mercy of God and the Holy Spirit are withdrawn from the earth as Jesus is preparing to come and get us. That many will realize that they may have opted out and they want to opt in, but guess what? It's too late. You know, once, once that date arrives in a class action lawsuit and the funds are to be dispersed or whatever it is, if you haven't opted in, 
You can't come back a month later and say, hey, I want to opt in, I want to opt in. There is no extension. Oh, the devil wants you to think there is. He wants you to think that there's still hope. There's still another chance. There's a lot of well-meaning Christians who really believe that Jesus comes and just gets a few of us, right? And then for seven years, he gives everybody else another chance. Friends, it doesn't work like that. That's one of the biggest lies you could ever be told. When God says it's ended, it's ended. And if anybody tells you otherwise, unless it's God himself, don't believe it. The mark of the beast is an awful thing. And you can get it in many ways. You can have it put in your forehead, which means you made a deliberate choice to opt out. You saw all the options, and you said, no, nope, no thanks, God, I'm out. There are other people who never take the time. They don't bother. They don't read the Bible. They don't go to church. They don't know anything about God. And they're opting out because it's in their hand. Brothers and sisters, we don't need that mark in our hand or in our head. We want the seal of God. Right? So, we have a choice. I don't know next week whether I'll see you folks or I'll not. Next Sabbath's my birthday. I'm, I'll probably be past you know, the four score and ten that, that God says we should be happy to live, right? I don't know. I don't know that I'll get that. But I do know that right now is the accepted time. Now is the time for me to make that decision, to check the box. Am I in or am I out? That's all I have to do. Just decide. Am I in or am I out? God takes care of the details. Right? He takes care of the rest of it. And you know what? By opting in, you can have a sense of peace and happiness that you've never felt before. Because now you don't have to worry about creating your case and giving your arguments and your excuses before the judge. None of that matters anymore. Now all that matters is loving God and serving him supremely, to love him and keep his commandments. At the end of the third angel's message, God points to the people that opt in. After he talks about, don't opt out, don't opt out, it's not a good choice. Don't get that mark, it's not a good choice. Then he points to the people who have the seal of God. And he says with great pride in his voice, with great satisfaction on his heart, with joy, he says, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. Friends, it's so easy. We make it hard. Can God point to you with joy and pride and say, brother, sister, I'm so glad you opted in. I'm so glad. Let's pray. Gracious Father, this morning I hope that in some way I might have assisted in helping each of us understand perhaps a little better the great plan you have in place, the plan that you've already taken care of, the plan that you started before we were ever born. Lord, may each of us recognize the importance of deciding, are we in or are we out? Really, that's all you're asking us to do, is to choose. And you're encouraging us in every way possible to opt in. Oh, Lord, may each of us here today make that better choice, allow you to seal us and to hold us for that day when you can usher us into the kingdom and say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into the joys of thy Lord. We long for that day. May it come soon. In Christ's name we ask these things. Amen.